This normal is it possible normalization of relationships between Saudi Arabia and Israel to me seems like a really big deal. What about you? I completely agree. Uh, first, I'm so delighted to be here with my good friend, Ray McGuire, and always so uh, proud to participate in delivering Alpha. Um, I think it's a, a hugely seismic opportunity. And just to put it into some context, when you see what happened with the Abraham Accords, where you had Sudan, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, normalized with Israel three years ago, those were the first peace deals in 25 years. Israel only had peace deals with Egypt and Jordan prior to that. It was so critical because it frankly continues the security cooperation that is so important in the region. It also enhances the standing up to Iranian aggression with the Gulf countries and Israel and the economic opportunities. Just in three years, you've seen $2 billion of trade and investment between the Emirates and Israel. One million Emiratis have gone to Israel as tourists. And those are pretty significant things because the population of those countries, 70%, is under the age of 30. And so those economic development, entrepreneurship opportunities are critical. But that, as seismic as it was and important, does not compare to what it will be like if you finally see a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Saudi Arabia, of course, holds a special place. As you know well, Brian, it is the keeper of the holy sites of Islam. The message that that will send to billions of Muslim people around the world is significant. And you also, these things happen in important moments in time. It is really in the interest of the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, the Prime Minister, Bibi Netanyahu, and President Biden, who deserves a lot of credit for taking what Trump achieved with the Abraham Accords and not throwing it out the window, but rather building on those steps to get to where you've got three leaders who are really pushing forward with this possibility yeah. of normalization. Ray, how do you view it? I couldn't agree more. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a great crowd. Great to be with you. Uh, you know, we can overstate the importance of this kind of alliance, not only geopolitically, but geoeconomically. Important to put this in context. The MENA region is about a $4 trillion economy, which puts it somewhere between India and Germany. And if you look at the sovereign wealth fund that exists there, there's probably $2 trillion or so of assets that will be deployed across the globe. Highly sophisticated investors looking to make their impact on what I identify as the five macro themes that are at play here. And those themes are gonna be a generative AI, energy transition, deglobalization in brackets, we need to return to that, uh, aging, both in North America, where the largest growing population is 65 and older. If you look at what Dina just cited in the region, it's gonna be below 35. Look at the continent of Africa, you're gonna see the same dynamic and cybersecurity. Why do I say cybersecurity? Because most of us live with these devices, device like this, and as we go through every day, there are some instances of somebody interloping into one of the uh, networks, so cybersecurity will be, be one of those. And if you think about the importance of Israel mm -hmm. to the world of technology and the advances of Israel have made, the kind of allegiances that we're describing now are allegiances that will be important to how we inform those macro things. Number three, what do you mean by deglobalization? So it's interesting. If I think in recent history, uh, Davos, uh, in Davos in 2016, I guess it was or so, where Xi Jinping comes on stage and talks about globalization. 19th Party Congress, now reinforced by the 20th Party Congress in China, one belt, one road. 60% of the world's population, 40% of the world's GDP. We're going to move outside. We talked about regionalization and nationalization. If you look at the supply chain, it's very difficult for us to deglobalize, given the reliance that we have across the globe uh, on geographies and non-Western geographies. So deglobalization, which is essentially the reindustrialization of America, how we do that, how we capture the industries that we used to have. Remember in the 70s, we peaked as an industrial, uh, in a, as an industrial yeah. economy. We change to a service-based economy. We outsource much of the industry. Today, we're going to have to reindustrialize this country. And there's some efforts going towards that, but a huge opportunity so that we can have a greater control of supply chain, which today, once it's disrupted, had a pretty big impact on our economy. So